This year, for the Feast Sermon video, we reached out beyond the home office to see how some of our members are coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. We contacted many of these people early in the quarantine in the March-April timeframe. I have been encouraged by their stories. This is our story as one body. You will see the stories of unity, hope, and overcoming new obstacles. Difficult as it has been, it's also been a year of rededication to the priorities in life, to God and to our church family. I pray you are inspired by your brothers and sisters as I was. Rudy Rangel, our home office video producer, will bring you more. When I was a kid, the Feast of Tabernacles was the highlight of the year. We had plenty, and we didn't have to worry about the difference between wants and needs. God commanded that we take this time to rejoice, and rejoice I did. This year has been new for all of us. It has been new for my family. Both my wife Judy and I work, and our kids go to school. In March, everything changed, and we went into quarantine. For the remainder of this school year, uh, our young people will continue to go to school remotely. We were trying to navigate online school and working from home. It was hard. It was hard for everyone. After spending Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Pentecost at home, I think more than ever we yearned for the Feast of Tabernacles and the hope that it gives us. I knew that we weren't alone. I was encouraged by the good that I saw happening on the internet. I know, good on the internet, yeah, right. But seriously, we have some brothers and sisters doing some amazing things. I'm making masks for a nursing home up in Michigan. First, I reached out to Rod Foster. Webcasting online church services were new for most of us. I wanted to talk to someone who was starting fresh. Mr. Foster was able to share how he pivoted to online services and what he did to keep members connected. So we had to start from scratch. I've never webcast before. Since my wife is a professional photographer, we had all of her studio equipment. I simply needed to come up to speed on how to do it. And uh, it was a pretty quick learning curve. That's cool. So does your family help run the equipment for each Sabbath? How does that, how does that work? They do. They make sure that, uh, you know, my tie is straight. They get me all set up and make sure the lighting is correct. And then all I have to concentrate on is giving the sermon. Yeah, it's good to have people in your corner who want to make you look good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Many of us shared in this new online church service. Ben Light in Oregon set up a command center to orchestrate all aspects of services. Chuck Smith in Florida uses a small green screen studio, and he connects weekly with multiple congregations, including the Caribbean, via Zoom. Paul Moody in Washington conducts Friday night hymn sings. Mr. Moody, along with Mike Imes, webcast services from multiple locations. Regardless of the pivots we've had to make, it hasn't stopped us from fellowshipping and leaning on one another for strength. What kind of struggles have you noticed that people are, are going through? I can sense an underlying anxiety, an underlying tension, but for the most part, enormous faith, enormous confidence and determination. Uh, what we're doing right now with our webcast is we're opening up a fellowship hour immediately after services. And we actually encourage brethren to go to their kitchen and get a cup of coffee like they would after services and actually have a live chat with each other. And I think that's the main benefit of doing the online local webcast is we stay together. Hey everyone. Hi David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, Sally. Hi there, everybody. Hey, Sally. Hi. Hi. My computer's hot today, so I might just disappear. Oh. <laughs> well, don't do that. What good can come out of what we've gone through together? The, the good that I've seen come out of this is a bit more focus from the brethren, a bit more attention back onto their first priority, which is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This national crisis has added a weight to people and much better focus on 
let's read the Bible every day, let's keep our prayers going. And I can tell that that focus is more in tune with the brethren now than it was prior to this crisis. Yeah, yeah. And things, how quickly they change, I think, for us as Christians, it shows that God can make things happen quite quickly. He can. And this lets us know that God is very much in charge. <laughs> His plan is very much in process, uh, whether we're paying attention or not. So it behooves us to pay close attention. One thing that was missing from our online church experience was a way to connect our children. This is Lizzie Creech from Indianapolis, Indiana. She began a virtual Sabbath school. My kids have really enjoyed connecting on Friday evenings. Lizzie is a natural and is so great with the kids. So we started the virtual Sabbath school mainly because I wanted the kids to be involved in something. I knew that the adults would have plenty of opportunities for Bible study that were online and our online services. Um, but I knew that the kids were being affected majorly by the lockdown. And so when my kids started asking kind of worried questions, and they were hearing their adults in their life like speaking in like these hushed tones and and not knowing what was going forward and on top of that we had these spring holy days which is such a fantastic opportunity to be with our brethren then i just really wanted to connect the kids to other kids i like that they have fun crafts and that most of my friends are doing it throughout different states i like I like the classes because it's like fun to see like other people do the same one. And then every time you look on Facebook and which ones I do, all my friends are doing the little ones. And I'm super glad that they're doing it because I like to do the same thing with my friends. When Judy and I watched the first one, we, we connected right away and you started uh, a little bit early and all the kids are saying hello. And then once you once you got into it, the first night, you basically talked about how hard everything is for the kids. I mean, you tackled it right away. Did you, did you feel that was important? I wanted them to know that it was okay to feel whatever feelings they were feeling. And it was okay to be a little nervous about it. And that it was okay to know that I was a little nervous about it. I just really wanted to be very, very honest during this time and just let them know that I'm here for them and that their parents are here for them and that it's okay to be unsure. What does it take for you to prepare for these each week? First, I say a whole lot of prayer because I really want God to speak through me. He knows what these kids need, and I'm just a vessel for that. So I really want him to guide me. And then I just dive into my Bible and see what kind of story pops out at me. I get a couple crafts together and I post them online to make sure that the parents have, you know, what they need. The response has been just fantastic from people in parts of the world who don't have members close to them. Their kids have never been in Sabbath school. And so it's been really fun for me to be able to connect those kids to other kids and also God's word in a really fun and engaging way. Gonna, we're going to ride this wave um, and just keep connecting to the kids. It's been an incredible experience. My name is Corbin Rose from Cincinnati, Ohio. During the lockdown, Corbin started a virtual choir. Maybe you saw it on Facebook. Maybe you were even a part of it. He has always been passionate about bringing people together and praising God through song for as long as I've known him. I talked to Corbin about how praising God in this way can be a powerful tool for unity and for worship. Corbin, you set up a virtual choir, and it's it's really cool. I've, I've seen, uh, I think, four or five of them now. How did this idea come about? Well, I was looking online, and a lot of people were saying that they were really missing um, being able to connect with people. Um, and, you know, while there's nothing to do about that physically, I think music is a way that, that people can connect together to worship God together in a collective way. I think there's something special about that. This idea sparked in my mind of maybe I could be um, 
a tool or a vessel to promote some, some sense of unity. And I kind of had this idea pop into my mind. And I think that idea was, was from God planting that seed to say, do this, do this work here to bring people together so that they can worship together and have that experience of unity. And I've learned enough that while it'd be a lot easier if God audibly spoke to us and said, go do this. Um, I think, you know, when you get that thought in your mind to do good, that just keeps on nagging you. It's a good idea to listen. That's so cool. What do you think it is about music that does bring people together? I think music can bind us together as it's sort of a, a language of its own. But I also think that, um, you know, God made music to be something that would connect us in a way that we can't really describe. That there's, I think, a spiritual component to music. You know, perhaps um, people might have a spiritual gift of music that they can understand that deeper level of it than just putting notes together. That language that transcends culture, transcends uh, different languages, um, that can just bind us all together. You have people from all over. How, how many different areas do you think you, you've connected with? Uh, from all over the states, uh, we've had participants from um, United Kingdom, from Chile, from India. So really just kind of a global effort that's bringing people together. God wants us to express our heart to him through that, that vehicle that he has created called music. And in, in that it's a way that we can we can express emotions, intellectual ideas, um, and just our essence of our being. You know, looking at the Bible with, with worship, the Levites were, were told to worship God with, you know, with all their might, you know, and they were professional musicians um, doing their service to God through, through praise and singing and worship and throwing their whole self into it. Yeah. So I think from, from the beginning, I think music was definitely supposed to be something very powerful, something very personal that gets to our heart and connects our heart to the heart of the one who made music. Having your first child is an exciting time. I knew two couples who were expecting this past April. I reached out to see how things were going as they visited doctors and tried to navigate childbirth with new restrictions in hospitals. Hi, I'm Kaylee Toms. I'm Chris Toms, and we're from Simi Valley, California. And we had twins during a pandemic. I work for a school district, and I was that week training my sub. I was just planning on leaving for maternity leave like the next week. And I got admitted to the hospital like two days later, all the schools shut down. So Chris would just come and tell me like the latest news. Yeah. And I don't know, it just sounded kind of scary out there. Uh, the kids were born seven weeks early. So we, they spent about yeah, seven weeks in the NICU, Amos. So that was kind of interesting to deal with that, with them allowing only one parent in the, the NICU at a time because of the COVID situation. Here we are um, at the hospital. This is our last day headed to the NICU. <laughs> Picking up our little boy. <laughs> Here we go. We're going to bring our baby boy home. We were just really worried about, you know, being exposed at all because we're constantly every day going into the NICU, which is a very vulnerable place yeah. with our little babies who are growing and vulnerable themselves. I'm so, you know, so grateful that you guys were able to have baby, you know, two babies, beautiful babies. Everyone's healthy. I, it's still such a huge blessing, even during a time that's very difficult. <laughs> hey, man. We need to continue to put our faith in God, and, and he, he worked it out for us, for sure. And there was a lot of questions going into the hospital, and they were all answered, and they were all answered uh, in, in a positive way for us. And we, we have two healthy little babies now, so it's yeah. it's been a huge uh, faith well, booster for yeah, us, definitely. I think. Yeah, definitely. All our prayers answered. And... 
think we're I'm really looking forward to sharing the kids with our local congregation. Yeah, They've just been, taking them out. <laughs> we've been having a Zoom church services every week, so they they make an appearance on there for the congregation. Yeah. And we're excited to share them with our church family when we get to be back in person with them. Hey, Amos. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, Amos. You smile for us again. <laughs> Happy two yeah, weeks. Look at Happy two weeks, Amos. Hola, mi nombre es Nicole Roy de Fenchel. Hola, mi nombre es Gavin Fenchel. Y vivimos en Santiago de Chile. So yeah, we heard a little bit about what you went through when you had Emmeline, and uh, I have seen the pictures, and she's absolutely beautiful. I can't wait to meet her. Could you go ahead and share your story? On May, I received a calling from my doctor saying that he had COVID. Yeah, so he 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 literally got like maybe three weeks before our due date, two weeks before our due date, something yeah. around that time. But he came down with COVID. Yeah. 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 After that, I I was a mess. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know what doctor um, like was going to deliver my baby. I don't know if I was going to trust him. Yeah. And also, I was like kind of kind of neurotic about it because I saw the doctor a week before. Yeah. So I didn't know if I had COVID. Yeah, exactly. By then, I was like 41 weeks. The midwife called me saying that Gary could eat like at the delivery, but not afterwards, like not with me. The, the, the father could only be there for the delivery and maybe, you know, an hour or two afterwards, and then I had to leave and Cole had to stay in the hospital, especially the C-section for three days. By myself. Uh, by herself, the baby. Uh, yeah, because it was like a bad news after another bad news. It wasn't uh, like, yeah. really, yeah. Did, did your original doctor, did he eventually heal from the virus and was he yeah, there yeah. three or four days ahead uh before we actually ended up doing the c-section he eventually tested negative uh for kobe and so he was he was the one that eventually did uh perform um the c-section again another huge blessing thing at the end everything was very healthy you came out fine baby came out fine well and then, and then the other big blessing was that eventually they did let me stay Oh yeah. Oh so good. The, so the <laughs> wife told us like just stay here until someone tells you to leave. If no one tells you to leave, so don't leave. Yeah. So we just gotta just hide it out in the room yeah. and tell someone <laughs> tell them you actually have to go. Right. And I think like the second day, someone officially came and was like, "Okay, you're allowed to stay here, but you cannot leave this room." All this is going on. Were you? I mean, were you ever afraid to go into the hospital? Like, were were you like, uh... I mean. COVID's not something that we can handle. Like we cannot yeah. say like, oh, we control this. I think at some point you have to trust God that everything is going to go well and and you will be fine yeah. by the end. Yeah. And that's what we did. <laughs> so we wanted to talk to you guys today because among all this, uh, you know, God still loves us and he's blessed you with a beautiful baby. And I'm so glad that you are all doing very well. And I miss you guys like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it is so good to see you, though. It's so good to see you. So thanks thanks for being with us. In April, New York City was all over the news. The crisis in New York reaching a critical mass. Paramedics now empowered to make life and death decisions that were once considered unthinkable. Teresa Armstrong, I'm from South Orange, New Jersey. Teresa attends the New Jersey North Congregation. She's an ER nurse. In the spring, nearly every ER patient coming in was a COVID case. Despite living near the epicenter, Teresa is strong, positive, and faithful. Can you explain like what a uh, evening looks like for you when you're when you're at work? Oh wow. So I would get there seven. <laughs> I would change it to my PPE. That's this white suit, goggles, N95 mask, mm. hair net, put the put the uh the white suit over it. That's gonna that takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Have you ever been afraid to go into work? Uh actually, no, I haven't. And, you know, the reason why is 
just praying, just prayer, just prayer, just prayer. I've been praying a lot of, like I said, a lot of, you might as well say the whole ER, almost the whole ER has been taken out. Hmm. Uh, we had one of our doctors die, but I haven't been afraid to go in. I've been going in, I've been praying before I go in, I've been praying once I got there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been right in the midst of everything and I have not, I haven't been afraid. Teresa was not afraid, but I was curious about how her family felt about her going into the hospital each night. Yeah, my son, because um, every time when I'm at work, I get a text, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. And he's worried because I'm in the midst of it, in the midst of the COVID. I tell him, just pray for me. You know, be afraid and so forth, just pray. Cause God made promises to us. God said that he hears us. God will protect us. Uh, remember Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel wasn't touched, you know, and uh, I have family members that, that are already passed from the COVID, but I'm still not afraid. I pray before I go in, I pray while I'm near. You know, I go in on my shift. I haven't called out. I'm not afraid. I look at the scriptures. I look at John 14, 1, when the Lord says, let your heart not be troubled. I look at, wow, I have all the scriptures here. Deuteronomy 31, 8, that God says he will go before us. He, do not fear. God is in control. Even Satan had to go before God before he was allowed to even try to touch Job. So God is in control of everything. A lot of times when we're in the middle of a crisis, we kind of just put our head down and um, just try to get through it. Would you say that you've learned anything yet as you've gone through this? It gave me time with God. Let me tell you something. And, and everybody in the church that knows me knows I'm a gym head. So a lot of times I was in a gym, in a gym, in a gym. Now, Everything is shut down. It's like God resetting and giving us a chance to get closer to him, to be thankful and to be content. All of the things that I was buying before and getting from the stores, I don't need, I mean, I don't need. You sort of learn to prioritize what's important. Exactly. With God's people, you know, don't get discouraged. I know, I know things right now look a little wacky, but we have to try not to look at what's in front of us. We have to try to look at what's, what's, what's the outcome as far as Christ is coming, as far as God is with us. We, we all know what, what happens in Revelation. We know what happens in the end. That's right. His kingdom is coming. That's right. You know, God tells us that. So focus, focus, you know, keep your armor on, focus, faith. You know, I get my face dirty sometimes. I, Got my face on the ground and in a house on the floor praying and yeah, my little eyelashes flicker <laughs> off and everything, but you know. <laughs> I think that talking to you has been very inspiring and I am so grateful to uh, to have talked to you. All right, Rudy, it's been good talking to you too. I love you, my brother. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. And I am going to pray for you. Thank you so much. It's been an unusual year. We've all had to make changes in our lives, be it church services, Sabbath school and learning worship, life events, and navigating this new world. But just like when I was a kid, I'm excited about celebrating the coming kingdom of God. My kids are excited about it too. The hope of the future restoration of all things is what we all share. It's why we're all here. What helps us navigate all the chaos of the world around us is our trust in God. He will return and set up a kingdom like we have never seen. In Daniel, we read a vision about his kingdom overtaking all other kingdoms. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. There will be no trace of kingdoms or governments we see today. God is replacing everything. I have been encouraged by what is happening in our church. I have seen the seeds of God's kingdom being sown. God's people are showing strength, adaptability, and good works. I can't wait for the world God has in store for all of mankind.